Well, good morning and welcome to Faith Bridge. So happy to see all of your beautiful faces here today. Uh, I am very excited to be here. We are going to be launching into a brand new two part series that we are calling Ugly Instincts, in which we are going to be examining some of Jesus' more difficult commands, commands that might even seem to be impossible because they go directly against our natural human instincts. And so today we're going to be examining the commands that are at, that are at the heart of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. So if you have your Bible, we're going to be in Matthew 5, 38 through 48. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, go ahead and raise your hand and an usher will bring you one. Uh, if you don't own a Bible, please keep that one. We love you and that is our gift to you. So Matthew 5, 38 through 48. It'll also be up on the screen behind me. Here we go. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what rewards do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even Gentiles do the same. You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. All right, so I want us to just imagine we're in that original audience for a moment so we can try to think about how shocking it would be to hear this for the first time. It's like, all right, so Jesus, not only are you rewriting our laws and our moral codes, um, but you want us to pray for and love our enemies, the people who want to hate us and the people who want to hurt us. And then you actually expect us to, like, if someone is trying to fight me, you don't want me to fight back. No, you want me to encourage them to keep fighting me. And if someone is suing me, you want me to be like, hold on, judge, objection. I'm not going to give that man $50,000. I'm going to give him $100,000. Or if an authority figure is asking you to do something unreasonable, you want me to be like, oh, hey, boss, yeah, no big deal that you called me in on, on my Saturday. I was just spending quality time with my family at the zoo. I went ahead and brought my sleeping bag, so I was just going to spend the night here, and I'll also work on Sunday as well, right? Is that really what he's asking us to do here? Oh, oh and I forgot. Be perfect, you know, like God. Like, these, this is impossible. There's no way this is possible. Like, I think Kierkegaard was thinking of this passage when he said this. He said, the Bible is very easy to understand. We pretend to be unable to understand it because we know very well that the minute we understand, we are obliged to act accordingly. Take any words in the New Testament and forget everything except pledging yourself to act accordingly. My God, you will say, if I do that, my whole life will be ruined. Like truly, this is one of those passages where it's like, yeah, okay, this is, this may be great in theory, right? Like loving one another, uh, peace on earth, kumbaya, all that kind of stuff, it's great. Uh, but th there's just no way this is going to work in real life. I mean, the real world has like terrorists and brutal dictators and Nazis are apparently making a comeback. Uh, and there's like serial killers and there's people who change lanes without using their blinker. And it's like, <laughs> how are we expected to ever really love those people? I mean, these commands, when you apply them to real world scenarios, they just, they don't seem feasible. I encountered one of those real world scenarios my junior year of high school while playing in the championship game of my YMCA basketball league. Uh, my YMCA team was me and a bunch of my close friends who were actually good at basketball. And, uh, and the game itself was super intense. And one of my good buddies, Sachi, uh, he was getting into it with a player on the other team. I, Sachi was playing super physical defense, just smothering the guy. The other guy didn't appreciate it. So at one point, uh, I think Sachi fouled him. The other guy gets in Sachi's face and they're face to face, face and they're just trading insults. You know, stuff about like haircuts and moms and... And uh, they're training insults, but then those insults turned into threats. They started threatening one another. And so I jump in and I separate them. And as I'm leading Sachi away, the other guy yells at Sachi, after the game, I'm going to get you. Now, 
we didn't really think anything of it at the time because if you've ever played like pickup basketball or YMCA basketball, people make empty threats all the time. It's kind of just a part of the game. You know, you learn to live with it. And so we kind of brushed it off uh, and we just kept going. And we ended up winning the championship game, by the way. It was awesome. I think my final stat line was like two points, one rebound and four fouls. <laughs> but I contributed. I was there. <laughs> and so after the game... Uh, we're all walking to our cars, and right when we get outside, I realize, ah, I forgot my basketball inside. And so I turn around, and I run inside, and I get my basketball. And as I'm walking back outside, I see my teammates, my friends, and they're huddled up right in front of our cars where we're parked. And then I see this other car pull up behind our cars, and it parks horizontally so that we couldn't back out. And then as soon as it parks, five guys from the other team all hop out of the car at once, and they start rushing towards my friends to attack them. And so I'm watching all this happen from about 50 yards away. And the first thing I see, and I'm kind of shocked, right? Like, I, like I'm not really even sure of what I'm seeing until I see two of those guys surround my best friend, Cameron. And they're both just swinging at Cameron. And I just see Cameron, and he has his hands up like this. And he's just doing his best to protect his face and his head. And it was at that point that adrenaline kicked in for me. And all logical, tactical thinking just shut down. And I don't really remember much past this point, but I do remember just letting out this guttural like, no, and I just threw my basketball and I took off running as fast as I could. And I kind of spear tackled one of the guys off of Cameron and we landed in some shrubs. Now here's the thing. I, so I have no like martial arts training or self-defense training. I, uh, I mean, I took Taekwondo for like three months when I was seven, uh, but that's about it. That's all I got. Um, however, I did play football throughout junior high and high school, so I knew how to tackle. Uh, I was trained to tackle, and when you're in a high-stress situation like that, where adrenaline is high and your instincts kick in, you kind of revert to those instincts or to your training, if you've had any. I was trained to tackle, so that's what I did. So I tackled this guy into the bushes, and I closed my eyes, and I just start swinging wildly. Now, here's what I didn't know had happened that my friends constantly remind me about, even to this day. As soon as I tackled this guy into the, into the shrubs, uh, this slippery dude somehow had wiggled out from underneath me almost immediately without me realizing it. So like, have you ever seen Looney Tunes where uh, Bugs Bunny is being attacked by like an angry mob and they all jump on him at once and it turns like a dust cloud of fists and dust and, uh, but then Bugs Bunny has slipped out secretly and they're just fighting each other? That's essentially what happened to me, but in real life. And so this guy had slipped out without me knowing it. And so I'm just swinging wildly at some shrubs, just beating up these shrubs. And these, those two guys that were focused on Cameron had now shifted their attention to me. And as I'm swinging at these shrubs, they're just kicking me in the back of the head. I know. Uh, here's the thing. I didn't even realize it was happening. I had no idea I was even being kicked. Adrenaline is crazy. I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but adrenaline is nuts. And I always like to think about, like, can you imagine if you were just like a casual observer watching this happen, and you see this dude who is just unleashing his fury on some landscaping while two guys are just like kicking him in the back of the head. Like, how weird that would be to see. It'd be such a strange thing to watch. It's super embarrassing. Anyway, so this whole fight, lasts maybe 30 seconds tops before one of the referees from the game runs outside and he yells, I just called the cops. And then in a blink of an eye, everyone scattered. It was amazing. Actually, for me, it was very disorienting because here I was fighting this shrub that I thought was a person. And then all of a sudden I stand up and it's just me and my teammates alone in a parking lot. Like, and we're just all thinking, what in the world just happened? And I learned that day that I could not be counted on in a fight. <laughs> However, if you have any shrubbery that's giving you trouble, I'm your guy, right? But looking back on that fight, uh, like I'm so thankful now that it's a funny story and not a tragic story because those fights so often, those kind of stories so often do not end well at all. Like thank God that no one was seriously injured. But when I do think back on that story and then I read these commands from Jesus that we just read, I just, I honestly, I don't see how obedience is possible in a situation like that. I mean, like, what was I supposed to do? We couldn't run. They had surprise attacked us. We didn't even know it was happening. We couldn't get in our cars and drive away. They blocked our cars. I'm almost positive they weren't willing to sit down and try to talk things out. Right? Like, 
Was Jesus serious when he commanded me to turn the other cheek in a situation like that? Like, should I have gone up to the guys who were punching my best friend in the face and be like, hey, you know who else has a good face for punching? This guy, right? <laughs> like, there's just, realistically, I don't understand how loving those people would have ever been possible. You know who else has a hard time with these commands? Jesus' disciples, particularly Peter. I want us to read Matthew 16, 21 through 23. Matthew 16, 21 through 23. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. And then on the third day, be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God but on the things of man. So Jesus is telling his disciples here, hey, listen, I'm going to be arrested, and then I'm, I'm going to be killed, and on the third day, I'm going to raise again. But I'm pretty sure Peter stopped listening after the arrested and killed part, right? Because he immediately takes Jesus aside, and he says, listen, there's no way that's going to happen, because I'm not going to let that happen. Right? Which it seems like a totally reasonable response from Peter. Like, if one of my friends or someone that I love came up and was like, hey, listen, I'm going to be arrested and killed soon, I'd be like, hey, let's maybe sit down and figure out a way to make that not happen, right? And Jesus was the Messiah. He was the one the Israelites had been waiting for and hoping for and praying for for thousands of years, and, and Peter knew that. And Peter loved Jesus. He had surrendered his life to Jesus. He had vowed to serve Jesus as king, and he was willing to defend his king at all costs. And, we, and when Peter expressed that sentiment to Jesus, Jesus called him Satan, Ouch, right? Like, that's got to sting. And then Jesus essentially tells him, Peter, you're not thinking clearly. Your mind is on the things of man, not the things of God. You're wanting to respond to threats and violence with more threats and violence. That's not how we do things anymore. And Peter clearly didn't get the message because when the time comes for the men to arrest Jesus, Peter's adrenaline kicks in, his instincts take over, and he unsheathes his sword, and he starts swinging, catching the ear of one of the men, one of the servants of the high priest, at which point Jesus responds, enough, Peter, put your sword away. What did I say? That's not how we do things anymore. If I wanted to, I could have thousands of angels here right now to fight this battle for me, but that's not what I want. Jesus is essentially telling Peter here, I don't need your protection. I need your obedience. Then Jesus stoops down and he picks up the mangled ear, that bloody, gory mess left by one of his own disciples. And he looks at the man in the eyes, the man who was sent there to lead him to his death. He looks him in the eyes and he heals him. He makes him whole. Why? Because Jesus loved that man. When Jesus looked at the man who was sent there to kill him, Jesus saw a child of God, beloved. Peter saw an enemy. See, Peter's eyes were set on the things of man. Peter's mind was on the things of man, the things of this world, not the things of God. And I think that that is the key for us to understand how in the world it's ever going to be possible for us to be obedient to Jesus' commands here. We need to learn to set our minds on the things of God, not on the things of man. So our goal here today is that we need to begin to train ourselves to see others, especially our enemies, as Christ sees them. We need to learn to look at others with divine eyes, not the eyes of man. See, our natural instinct is to dehumanize our enemies, which makes sense. When we dehumanize people, it makes it easier for us to belittle those people or attack those people. I mean, just think about what happens if you're driving and someone cuts you off in traffic, right? I'm almost willing to bet that your first instinct is not to go, you know what, driving is already super stressful and, you know, I'm sure I've cut off plenty of people on accident or maybe they're just in a big hurry, like they're late for work or they really have to go to the bathroom or whatever, you know? It's like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go ahead and pray for this person right now. That's what I'm going to do. None of us do that, right? Like my first instinct is to try to pull alongside that bozo to see what kind of sociopath drives in Houston like they're playing Grand Theft Auto, right? 
Right? And then I want to retaliate. I want to cut them off. Right? And just think about the language even I just used there. Bozo, sociopath. We want to dehumanize. Our natural instinct, if we perceive that someone is against us, or especially if we perceive that someone is a threat or a threat to our loved ones, is we dehumanize them. Or even worse, we demonize them. We declare that those people are evil and the world would be better without them. And those are the instincts that we must unlearn. We have to unlearn those instincts. In complete submission and obedience to our King Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we must train ourselves to see others, especially our enemies with divine eyes, as human beings, beloved children of God. And that is not an easy thing to do at all. It is incredibly difficult. It's going to take a lot of training and practice. So I want to give us three steps, three ways that we can begin to learn how to reorient our instincts and see others with divine eyes, the way that Christ sees them. So the first thing we need to do is we need to know, we need to have our identity firmly rooted in Christ. We need to know who we are in Christ. I I would imagine that the original audience, when they heard Jesus' commands, they had no idea how obedience was possible. His own disciples had no idea how obedience was possible until they watched Jesus live out his own teachings. They watched, him, they watched Jesus live in complete obedience to his own commands. They watched as Jesus did not resist the men that came there to arrest him, even though he was truly innocent, the only one who's ever been truly innocent. He did not retaliate when they stripped all of his clothes off of him. He did not fight back with every lash that he received. He carried his own cross, his torture device, until his strength failed him. And when he was nailed to the cross and pierced through the side, he looked down on his torturers. He looked down on the men that were murdering him. And his eyes were full of love. He saw beloved children of God. He saw the people that he was there to save and redeem. And gasping for breath, he cries out to his father in prayer, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing, they're lost. And that moment right there, that is Jesus displaying his full power. Jesus doesn't display his full power by walking on water or calming the waves or healing the blind person or resurrecting someone from the grave. Jesus never displays his power by beating up his enemies, fighting back, or by establishing dominance over the people that are against him. Jesus displayed his full power through his self-sacrificial love on the cross. And because of his self-sacrificial love and because of his resurrection three days later, our sins have been forgiven. We have been washed clean. Not only that, but Satan has been stripped of his power and we have victory over the grave. The grave has lost its sting. When I tell you that these commands are at the heart of his sermon, it's because these commands are at the heart of the gospel, of our good news. Let's read Romans 5, 8 through 10. Romans 5, 8 8 through 10, Paul says this. For if while we were enemies, I'm sorry, let me back up. But God showed his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, We were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. So here's what we need to understand. If we're going to have our identity fully rooted in Christ, all of us are sinners. All of us have sinned. And all of us have walked as enemies towards God. All of us. I know that I have walked in disobedience. I have rejected God for his creation. I have hurt or destroyed things or people that God cares dearly about. And Jesus interceded on my behalf and he prayed to his father, Father, forgive Adam. He doesn't know what he's doing. He's lost. And you need to know that he prays that same prayer for you too. Even if right now you still feel like an enemy, if you feel like you're just too far gone for redemption, you need to know that Jesus looks at you and his eyes are full of love. He sees a beloved child of God and he offers you 
forgiveness of sins, grace, victory over the grave. And when we accept that forgiveness, when we accept that grace, we must keep our eyes focused on the cross. We must daily remind ourselves of the gift of grace that we have in Jesus. And when we do that, when we daily remind ourselves of our gift of grace, that's when the Holy Spirit works in us to tenderize our hearts and then correct our vision. And the grace and love of Jesus will begin to flow in us and out of us. And what will happen is instead of looking at your enemy and seeing all of the sins they've committed against you, all the wrongdoings or all the things that you don't like about them, the things that make you angry, instead, you will learn to look past that and you'll see yourself in them. You will learn to peer beyond their sins and wrongdoing and you'll see a person just like you. You will see a human being who's made of the same stuff as you, by the same God as you, who needs the love and forgiveness of Jesus, just like you do. But again, this is difficult to do, to see others in this way. Even when we know who we are in Christ, it's very impossible. It's, not, it's very difficult to do, almost impossible. Uh, so we also must just constantly practice. And that's step number two. We need to intentionally practice seeing others with divine eyes. When I was 17 and fighting a bush that I thought was a person, I was just going with my instincts in my training, right? And when Peter unsheathed the sword and started swinging, he was going with his instincts. That's what happens in high stress situations, in crisis modes. You end up reverting to your instincts or your training if you've had any. That's why so many uh, professions require thousands of hours of training. Military, police, firefighters, doctors, paramedics, all those professionals have trained for thousands of hours so that when the bullets start flying or the patient stops breathing or they're the ones being looked to in an emergency situation, they are prepared. They know what to do. If we are going to have any hope of being obedient to a command like loving your enemy and not retaliating and praying for them, commands which go against our natural instincts, well, then we better practice. We better train ourselves. For Lent, I decided to uh, fast from Twitter and also from a bunch of these political blogs and websites that I was following. Um, I was becoming obsessed with political news and I was every single day reading all these like, hot takes and opinion pieces by all these different people. And what was happening to me is that just like our current political environment, I was starting to divide people into all these categories of uh, they're right, they're wrong, they're the good guys, they're the bad guys, it's us versus them, things like that. And it was just turning me into this really negative person who was itching for a fight. I felt like I was looking for it. I could just sense that there was this anger in me that had moved well beyond any kind of righteous anger, and it turned into this poisonous anger that eventually leads to hatred. And it was causing me to lose sight of people's humanity. Worse than that, it was causing me to lose sight of the cross. I was losing the hope that I have in Jesus because all I could see around me all the time was the brokenness around me, and all the people that I judge were contributing to that brokenness. And I can tell you that since fasting from Twitter and all those political sites and everything, uh, my wife has commented numerous times, my wife Kathleen, she has told me how I'm so much less like, anxious now. And I'm not near as negative all the time as I was before. Like, do I still care about those things? Absolutely, I do. Do I look favorably on those people that I was once against? Not quite. I'm trying, I promise. Like, I'm, and that's the whole thing. Like, I'm trying. I'm... I am striving to see their humanity. And I can tell you that I'm focusing on the cross way more than I was before, and I'm doing my best to see others the way that Christ sees them. And I can tell you that my anger towards those people has lessened significantly. So ask yourself, who are the people, who's the person that you consider to be your enemy? Or who is the people or people groups that you consider to be your enemy. Or maybe you've never even thought about them in those terms before, like as an enemy. But sit and think for a minute and be real honest with yourself. Who is the person or people groups that you might dehumanize without even realizing it? That when you think of them, you automatically attach labels to them. And then I want you to think, what are some creative, practical ways that you can practice seeing their humanity? I would suggest starting small. I'll give you, uh, I'll give you an example. 
pay attention to the way that uh, news organizations and politicians and other people will label entire people groups, especially if you know that you're kind of biased against them, then really pay attention to the way that those people groups will be labeled by news organizations and other people. You will hear them say words uh, to dehumanize them, like animals or thugs or illegals or vermins, words that should never be used to label people. And then every time you hear a word like that, just catch it mentally and then correct it. Even if in your heart you might think, actually, that's how I think of those people. Just try, just try this. Catch those words in your head and then mentally switch it and say, no, those people aren't animals. They are children of God. They are beloved. They are people. And when you do that, just see how God softens your heart. Another practice, one of the best practices, because the one that Jesus gave us, is to pray for your enemies. You'll find that when you pray for someone who has wronged you or who you consider to be your enemy, you are allowing God the opportunity to reorient your thinking towards those people, to soften your heart towards those people, to change your instincts towards those people. Or maybe prayer is not even possible for you right now, praying for your enemies, because someone really hurt you, and that wound is still fresh. That pain is still feels unbearable. And so forgiveness for that person just seems impossible. That's okay. Again, start small. Maybe pray that God will heal you, will heal that wound, will take away that pain. And then you can pray that maybe God will move you to a place where forgiveness at least seems possible. There are always steps that we can take towards forgiveness. And I do feel like it's important to give a disclaimer here. If you are like currently in an abusive situation, I'm not advocating, I'm not say, saying you just stay in it and just keep forgiving over and over again. Do everything in your power to get out of that situation. If you know someone who is in an abusive situation, do everything in your power to get them out. Jesus' commands here are not about being passive in the face of violence or evil. Jesus is never passive, ever. These commands, Jesus gives us these commands to equip his followers with the tools to combat evil, to battle the real enemy. And those tools are love, forgiveness, and prayer. And that's step three. Step three, if we're ever going to be able to look at others with divine eyes, is we need to know who our real enemy is. So Ephesians 6, 10 through 12, Paul says this, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Our battle is never ever against flesh and blood. If you believe that your real enemy is a human being, then you have been deceived by the devil. That's why it's so important that we must constantly keep our focus on the cross and learn to see others with divine eyes because Satan is really trying hard to blind you. And if your response to evil or to wrongdoing is more evil, more hatred, more violence, then you are doing the devil's bidding. When we retaliate in an effort to try to balance the scales of justice, we are just adding more evil and darkness to the world. It's like a, a gambler who goes into a casino and loses all of his money, and so then he goes and he takes out a loan to go back to that casino to try to win all of his money back. Odds are, he's not going to win his money back. What's probably going to happen is he's going to give that casino even more money, and he is going to be even more in debt. We must stop contributing to the darkness of this world and start fighting the real enemy. And love and forgiveness and prayer are our weapons of spiritual warfare to battle the real enemy. I'll give you an example of what this looks like. On June 17th, 2015, a 21-year-old white supremacist, Dylan Roof, murdered nine African Americans during a prayer service at Emmanuel Church in Charleston, South Carolina. I'm sure that most of you remember this horrific event. It was shocking it was horrifying. Unfortunately, it wasn't too surprising because violence and racism are ancient demons that have plagued our nation for far too long. We are in desperate need of an exorcism. 
But then something remarkable happened in the midst of this awful tragedy. For once, it wasn't just the terrorist and his evil actions that dominated the news cycle, like what so typically happens. But it was the story of this congregation's extreme forgiveness offered to Dylan. Nadine Collier, who is the daughter of Ethel Lance, who was murdered that day, she looked at Dylan during his trial and she said, I forgive you. You took something very precious from me. I will never talk to her again. I will never ever hold her again. But I forgive you and have mercy on your soul. The Payne Middleton doctor was also murdered that day, and her sister said this to Dylan. She said, I acknowledge that I am very angry. But one thing that the Payne always enjoined in our family is she taught me that we are a family that love built. We have no room for hating, so we have to forgive. I pray God on your soul. These statements are so remarkable because they go directly against our instincts. Our instincts are to hate anyone that commits such an awful atrocity like Dylan did. But this congregation, Emmanuel Church, had no room in their hearts for hating, only prayer. And our instinct is to view someone like Dylan who did something so evil as an animal. But this congregation viewed Dylan as a human with a soul. Wanda Simmons, whose grandfather, Daniel Simmons, was also murdered that day. She said that the pleas for Dylan's soul were proof that hate won't win. So here we have Dylan, a white supremacist, who committed a terrorist attack against a black church in order to spark some kind of racial civil war. And these saints... These disciples of Jesus at Emmanuel Church, they refused to play the devil's game. And they responded with hate won't win. And for once, our nation was not exposed solely to the depraved nature of man, but also to the love and forgiveness and hope that Jesus gives his children in the midst of suffering. The world got to see the gospel. The congregation of Emmanuel Church bore witness to the risen Christ for the world to see. Their love and grace and kindness and mercy, that is the brick and mortar of God's kingdom. Who knows how many souls were added to the kingdom that day because of their witness. When we refuse to play the devil's game, when we refuse to add any more pain or hate or violence or suffering into the world, that is victory over Satan. One of my favorite quotes ever is from a nun, Sister Margaret. She said this, Satan doesn't know how to respond to the gentleness of God's spirit. When I said earlier that Jesus' victory on the cross, it stripped Satan of his power, this is what I meant. When we respond to evil with love, when we pray for and forgive the people who have hurt us, who have done wrong against us, when we refuse to demonize or dehumanize people anymore, our enemy doesn't know what to do. He has no idea. When we learn to see others through the eyes of Christ, through divine eyes, our enemy has lost his power over us. What I want to do now is I want to lead us in kind of an extended time of prayer because I know that what Jesus is asking us to do here probably still feels impossible, right? Like, even if we keep our eyes on the cross and we know who we are in Christ, and even if we practice every day trying to see others through his eyes to try to love our enemies, and even if we know truly who our real enemy is, there's just so much evil in this world, and there's so many hypothetical situations that we can imagine in which we know there's just no way I'm going to turn the other cheek. It's just not going to happen. It's not possible. But I want you to maybe try to think of it a little bit differently. When Jesus tells us to go and sin no more, is our response, well, that's not going to happen. Might as well not even try. No. Our response is to do our best to be obedient, even though we know we might fail. We probably will fail. We definitely will fail. 
We still strive for obedience every day. And that's where prayer comes in. It's so crucial. Without prayer, it's not going to happen. We need God's help. We need the Holy Spirit to help us be more and more obedient every single day. So to begin this time of prayer, I want to read to you a quote from Thomas Merton. Thomas Merton was a Christian monk who is also a theologian and a writer, and he spent a majority of his life faithfully pursuing Jesus. And so if you would right now, go ahead and close your eyes, bow your heads, we can dim the lights. And I want you to just let these words wash over you and maybe get you in a mindset where you can imagine what's possible when we strive for obedience. Thomas Merton said this, in Louisville, at the corner of 4th and Walnut, In the center of the shopping district, I was suddenly overwhelmed with this realization that I loved all these people, that they were mine and I theirs. It was as if I suddenly saw the secret beauty of their hearts, the depths of their hearts, where neither sin nor desire nor self-knowledge can reach, the core of their reality, the person that each one of us is in God's eyes. If only they could all see themselves as they really are. But it cannot be explained. There is no way of telling people that they are all walking around shining like the sun. Father, this this is our prayer. That we would learn to see others as you see them. Full of love. Bright and shining like the sun. Father, but we confess that this is not easy. People, for us, are not easy to love. There's just so much pain and so much hurt, so much suffering in this world, so much wrongdoing. So Father, truly, this is out of obedience that we come to you right now. And we lift up our enemies in prayer, not because we necessarily want to, but because the love of Christ compels us to. So wherever you are in your seat right now, go ahead and call your enemy or enemies to mind. The people that you sense deep down that you dehumanize or maybe even demonize. Father, we pray for our enemy. We pray for their repentance, for their conversion and their salvation. Father, and we ask that your Holy Spirit softens their hearts towards you. And we also ask that your Holy Spirit softens our hearts towards them. That we may one day learn to love them and be your hands and feet in loving kindness towards them. Father, give us eyes to see them as you see them. Father, and there's some of us in this room who that prayer, it just didn't happen because the pain is still too much. Father, I pray that right now your Holy Spirit is doing a miraculous healing work in their lives. And if that's you in this room right now, I'm just gonna ask you to do your best to just open yourself up to that healing. Surrender yourself to the Holy Spirit and not just cling on to that pain, but allow him to heal you. Father, we ask for healing, and we ask that you move those of us who can't quite forgive yet, that you move us to a place where at least forgiveness is in the realm of possibilities. Father, we know that there might be some people in this room who don't know you, who don't know the way that you look at them, who don't know how you see them just full of love. Father, we want to lift those people up now. We pray that your Holy Spirit is working in their hearts even now. Make them fully aware of how you see them as your beloved child. That they are not an enemy to you. They are your creation, who you created out of your love. Father, we just desperately need your Holy Spirit to work in our lives, to combat all these 
all this darkness in this world. There's so much of it. There's so much evil, so much suffering. Everywhere we turn, there's more pain. So Father, fill us full of your love and of your forgiveness and of your hope so that we as a congregation can go out into the world and just push out that darkness. Declare to Satan and the principalities and powers and the cosmic forces of darkness, you have no authority here. We have victory over you because of our King Jesus. Father, we're just so thankful for that victory and we're so thankful for your love. And we ask all of this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.